In a Peanuts comic strip, Sally was struggling with her memory verse for Sunday. She was absorbed in her thoughts, trying to figure out when she remembered. Maybe it was something from the book of reevaluation. She never did find the memory verse, but we should always read the Bible with the intent of reevaluating our attitudes and actions to make sure that they're in line with the truth of God's word. And so that's what I hope today's message will do, to show you if your attitude and actions match up with what the word of God says. And so in a message I've titled um, more than a four-letter word, we're going to look at what it says in 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 through 17. And you evaluate our actions and attitudes to see if they match up with what it says there. Now, in case you're wondering, I've chosen this passage for a couple of reasons. First of all, with a new year quickly approaching, it's good to be reminded what love in action looks like and so that we'll thrive as a church and in our community. We want people to know the love that we have. We want Fresh Vision to be known as a church of people who just love each other. They can, anybody can walk in and they're going to be loved. And secondly, there may be some of you who are ready to serve, ready to, to share the love of God to others and ready to, to display it and, and give it to others, but you don't know how to begin. And so hopefully this message also will help you to show you some ways to do that. But uh, there's other, another thing that comes to mind is, you know, as, as a Christian, you know, if you've been a Christian for a while now, a believer, you know, this passage here will show you what that, you know, what love in action looks like. It's easy to, to just say, oh, yeah, we love our brother, we love our sister in Christ, but do you really? Do you really have a deep, sincere love for your brother and sister in Christ? You know, can you look at the person across the way and say, man, I really love that person. I really want what's best for them, and I want to help them in any way I can. And do your actions show that? So, yes, this kind of passage may challenge some of you and may reinforce some things as well for some of you. And so before we get into God's word this morning, let's pray and and ask him to speak to us through his word. Lord, Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you brought us here this morning, that you've um, been so good to us and amazing, and you've given us grace and mercy, and you've, you've just showered us with so many blessings, Lord. Blessings that we often forget. And so now as we sit... And listen to your word, Lord. I pray that you will speak to each and every person that's here powerfully. I pray that you will speak to those who are listening or watching this live or listening to this message later on or watching it later on, Lord. I pray that you will also speak to them powerfully, that you will show them new truth, that you will show them your love, that you will change lives, Lord. They will come to you, surrender their lives to you. They will understand what true love looks like. Heavenly Father, we surrender to you now and give this time to you. Fill this room with your spirit. Lord, we want to hear from you now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Like I said, we'll be in 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, verse 11. For this, re for this is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Unlike Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? 
because his deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers and sisters. The one who does not love remains in death. Everyone who hates his brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. In uh, this particular section that we just read, um, John is explaining to those reading this letter to the early church, those in the early church, and to us now, that one of the important characteristics that distinguishes uh, that love, I'm sorry, um, is one of the important uh, characteristics that distinguishes God's children and those who are not. He begins by explaining that the mark of those who belong to the truth is genuine love for fellow believers. Genuine love for fellow believers. The kind of love that he's speaking of here is agape love. Not a phileo love, a brotherly love, but a deep, sincere love. And let me explain what I mean. That word agape love is a Greek word. And the essence of agape love is goodwill, benevolence, and a willful delight in the object of love. And so in the context here, the object of this love is towards other believers, is towards that person that's sitting across from you, is towards that person that's sitting next to you, other believers that are attending different churches, true believers in Christ. Now, when you accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, it also included a command from him that we must have, we must now have an agape love for each other. So you see, when you display this agape love, that's what distinguishes you as a believer from an unbeliever. Now, before he goes into detail about what genuine love looks like, John uses the Old Testament story of Cain and Abel to illustrate the importance of genuine love. For those who may not be familiar with the story, it says in Genesis chapter 4 that Adam and Eve had two children named Cain and Abel. Well, one day Cain became furious that God found Abel's offerings more acceptable than his own, and in a fit of rage, he murdered his brother. And then, in verse 12 of our passage here, John explains why he killed him. Here's the thing, though. He's using the story to convey an important point about love. See, God knows the motives of a person's heart. And if there isn't genuine love behind what's done for him, what's done for God, he will not find it pleasing and acceptable. However, if the motives behind a, what a person does for the Lord comes from a pure and sincere heart, God will find those offerings pleasing and acceptable because it glorifies him. And he is pleased. He smiles upon anything that glorifies him. So what he's essentially saying then here with, uh, about Cain and Abel is don't love like Cain. Love like Abel. See, jealousy lay behind Cain's hatred. Not the jealousy which covets another's greater gifts, but that which resents another's greater righteousness. This is the kind of envy which made the Jewish priests demand the death of Jesus. Brother and sister in Christ, the next time you start to feel hatred towards another Christian, 
ask yourself, why? Why am I feeling this way towards another child of God, towards my brother and sister in Christ? Is it jealousy? Is it envy? Be honest with yourself. Is it those things? If so, if that's what it is, then I'll be honest with you, you're in sin. And you need to repent, ask for forgiveness, and seek reconciliation. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. So if you're offering your gift on the altar, and there you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with your brother and sister, and then come and offer your gift. Be reconciled to that person, be reconciled to God, and then offer that gift, and the Lord again will find it pleasing and acceptable. Christian, let me remind you again. Love like Abel. I like how one pastor put it. When there are two children of God who are both right with God, there will be love. Well, John then continues in verse 13 by informing us that when the love for God manifests, manifests itself in acts of sincere love, don't be surprised if the world hates you. The world that he's referring to are unbelievers who don't know God and who are under the power and influence of the evil one. So John here is warning us that as believers, we shouldn't be shocked when the world's hatred for God extends towards us, towards believers who belong to him, who belong to God. However, he says in verse 14, the mutual love believers have for one another is what, again, distinguishes them who've passed from death to life. He's making the point again that mutual love is the basic sign, is a basic sign of being born again. John then pulls out the Old Testament, the, the Old Testament, uh, the sixth commandment there to clarify any confusion. He says in verse 15, everyone who hates his brother or sister is a murderer. He may have had in mind here, John, when he wrote this, he may have had in mind Jesus' words from the Sermon on the Mount where he talked about hatred in Matthew chapter 5, verse 21 and 22. And if so, then he's reiterating what Jesus had taught about the true meaning of the sixth commandment. To hate your brother or sister is to murder him in your heart. Charles Spurgeon said this, Every man who hates another has the venom of murder in his veins. He may never actually take the deadly weapons into his hand and destroy life, but if he wishes that his brother were out of the way, if he would be glad if no such person existed, that feeling amounts to murder in the judgment of God. Serious stuff. At the end of verse 15, John adds, And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. What he's saying here is to live in the practice of murder or to have a lifestyle of the habitual hatred of your brothers and sisters is a demonstration that we do not have eternal life abiding in us, that we're not born again. You feel guilty, you should feel bad, convicted when those feelings do come up. Even if that person wronged you, even if the person did something horrible to you, that hatred shouldn't be there in your heart. That conviction should be, and you know, ask the Lord to forgive you. Work it out with the Lord. Tell him to give you that peace. 
You know, a lot of times a person has done you wrong, they're not going to ask for forgiveness. And you're going to be waiting forever. You might be waiting forever for that forgiveness, but you don't have to. You can forgive that person in your heart. You find that peace by just really forgiving that person sincerely in your heart. Consider that. Someone's hurt you really bad. Before we move on to the last few verses of our passage, let me just take a moment to point out three important truths in verse, from verses 11 through 15 that you should hold on to. True agape love is what sets, sets apart a believer from a non-believer. Jesus said in John 13, 35, By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The world has its own standard and definition of love. But as Christians, we know we have a new standard of love that has been defined by Jesus. Number two, true agape love is pleasing and acceptable to the Lord. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 16 tells us, don't neglect to do what is good and to share. For God is pleased with such sacrifices. I'll share with you a story. William Gladstone, in announcing the death of Princess Alice to the House of Commons, told a touching story. The little daughter of the princess was seriously ill with diphtheria. The doctors told the princess not to kiss her little daughter and endanger her life by breathing the child's breath. Once, when the child was struggling to breathe, the mother, forgetting herself entirely, took the little one into her arms to keep her from choking to death. Rasping and struggling for life, the child said, Mama, kiss me. Without thinking of herself, the mother tenderly kissed her daughter. She got diphtheria. And some days thereafter, she went to be forever with the Lord. Real love forgets self. Real love knows no danger. Real love doesn't count the cost. The Bible says, many waters cannot quench love. Neither can the floods drown it. Number three, true agape love is a basic sign of being born again and children of God. John said this in the following chapter, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, said this, Dear friends, let us love one another, because love is from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Now again, this isn't just a superficial phileo type love. This is that deep, sincere, agape love. It's natural to love them that love us, but it's supernatural to love them that hate us. Okay, so now that he's explained what genuine or agape love is, in the next couple of verses, he explains how to apply that love into action. So let's pick up in verse 16. First John chapter 3, verse 16. This is how we have come to know love. He laid down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has this world's goods and sees a fellow believer in need but withholds compassion from him, how does God's love reside in them? Little children, let us not love in word or speech, but in action and in truth. In his book, And You Know You Should Be Glad, author Bob Green shares this story. When during an already painful juncture in my life, uh, in my life, my wife died. 
I was so numb that I felt dead myself. In the hours after her death, as our children and I tried to figure out what to do next, how to get from hour to hour, the phone must have been ringing, but I have no recollection of it. The next morning, one of those, one of those mornings when you awaken, blink to start the day, and then a dis, dispiriting second later realize anew that just uh, what had just happened and feel the boulder press against your teeth with such weight you fear you will never be able to get up. The phone rang. And it was Jack. I didn't want to hear any voice, even his voice. I just wanted to cover myself with darkness. I knew he, he would be asking if there was anything he can do. But I should have known that he had already done it. I'm in Chicago, he said. I took the first flight this morning. I know you probably don't want to see anyone, he went on. That's all right. I've checked into a hotel. And I'll just sit here in case you need, any, need me to do anything. I can do whatever you want, or I can do nothing. He meant it. He knew the best thing he could do was to present, was, was to be present in the same town, to tell me he was there. And he did just sit there. I assume he watched TV or did some work but he waited until I gathered my strength to say I needed him. He helped me with things no man ever wants or, need, or to need help with. Mostly, he sat with me and knew I did not require conversation, did not welcome chatter, did not need anything beyond the knowledge he was there. He brought food for my children and by sharing my silence, he got me through those days. I mention this story because it perfectly illustrates how sacrificial love can be as simple as just sitting there with someone going through a really difficult time. In this last section of chapter, or this last two verses that we covered here, John points out the practical aspects a loving each other through actions. He first does this by telling his readers how genuine love be became apparent to them all. He, Jesus, laid down his life for us. Prior to his death, Jesus said this in John chapter 10, verse 11. He said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. He proved it. Not too long after that, he hung on that wooden cross. Because Jesus is sacrificed, Paul said this in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. See, these verses are meant to show you that when Jesus Christ died for us, when he died for you, he exemplified the sort of love which expends itself in the interest of others. It's the kind of sacrificial love that John says we Christians ought to imitate. As Christ loved us and laid down his life for us, we, so we too must do the same for one another. When Jesus was with his disciples at the final supper, at the final supper before his death, he said to them, this is my command. Love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, that someone will lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I keep in mind that verse 16 of our passage, John isn't necessarily speaking of an extreme kind of sacrifice involving a believer dying for another believer. As you will see, he's speaking of something far more simple and practical. 
Here's, our, here's how the New Living Translation puts verse 17. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? You see, what John is saying here is that God isn't asking believers to be martyrs. He's simply saying that as believers, our love will be known by our willingness to sacrifice what's important to us in order to help a fellow believer in need. And that's the idea behind Jesus' parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. In that story, he told, he, he told uh, of, the new, of the Good Samaritan who was on a journey. Back then, people didn't take journeys just for the fun of it. They took journeys to get something important done. He could have continued on his important journey after giving the wounded man first aid and a ride to the nearest inn, but he didn't. The Good Samaritan put aside what was important for him and went back to the inn the following day to make sure the man wouldn't be put out on the streets before he was fully healed. You see, it doesn't take much effort to buy a loaf of bread for a brother or sister in need. But to go out of your but to go out and buy a month or two worth of groceries for them takes sacrifice. Warren Wisby said this, a man does not have to murder in order to sin. Hatred is murder in his heart, but a man need not even hate his brother to be guilty of sin. All he has to do is ignore him or be indifferent towards his needs. If you're a believer with the financial and material needs to help another believer then, then it's better to help them than to know that brother or sister is suffering and do nothing about it. I'm sure that if you go out of your way and see if someone has it, not just a financial need, it could be anything. Find out, go look for those ways that you can serve your fellow brother and sister. There's needs everywhere. And they don't have to be your friends. They can be total strangers as well. Well, John then says in verse 18, Little children, we must not love with word or speech, but with action and in truth. The word love in word means simply to talk about the need. But to love in action means to do something about meeting it, about meeting that need. To love in speech, is the opposite to love in truth. It means to love insincerely. To love in truth, therefore, means to love a person, to love your fellow believer genuinely from the heart and not just with the tongue. So this is John's way of tenderly telling us that true loving actions Speak louder than words. A good verse that speaks of true love in action is found in James chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. There it says, If a brother or sister is without clothes and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm, and eat well, but you don't give them what the body needs, what good is it? Yes, that question, what good is it? It takes more effort to show the Christian you're sitting next to you actually love them than to tell them you do. So, Christian, if you want to be known for showing true, genuine, agape love, verses 16 through 18 gives you some practical ways to display that genuine love. 
Number one, you can exhibit love by looking out for the interests of other believers. I'll share with you another verse about that. Paul mentioned, in, mentioned this in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look, look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. The great evangelist Billy Graham once said, the highest form of worship is the worship of unselfish Christian service. Secondly, there's another practical, a second practical way you can display genuine love. You can exhibit love by having a heart of sacrificial giving. If you're a believer with the financial and material needs to help another believer, then it's better to help them and to know again that, the, that that person, that brother or sister is suffering and do nothing about it. If and when you do give, I want to share with you three important conditions to personally consider. Number one, do you have the means to meet the need? What I'm saying is don't go beyond what you are able to give or help with. I mean, you can if you're able to, but don't, you know, you, you want to feed your family first. That's what I mean. You want to feed your kids first before you feed that person. You know, if all you have is, you know, one loaf of bread, yeah, you can give them half of it, but make sure you take care of your, your children. That, that's your responsibility. That's your ministry. God gave you that, that family, that wife, those children for you to cherish, to take care of, to protect and to, uh, to provide. If someone is asking you for $10 and all you have is five, then you don't have the means to meet that need. Give them what you can. Again. Secondly, are you aware that there is a need? Do what you can to understand what a person's actual need is, needs are. You shouldn't assume that just because someone looks unkept or skinny, malnourished, or just skinny in general, I mean, that they have no money or clothes to buy food. My, you know, I, I, my dad was the kind of person that never really took care of himself. You would see him on the street, you think he's, he's, uh, he looks kind of homeless. His hair's all crazy, his beard, and his clothes are all dirty and messy. And, and there were several times he, you know, I was talking to him, and he would say people would want to give him money because he, he looked like he was homeless, but he didn't. He has a home in two homes, one in TJ and one in, one in, in San Diego. You know? So be careful about jumping to those conclusions. You never know. Find out you know, if you can to find out their story. You know, don't assume that that person that you're giving that dollar to is going to go out and automatically buy drugs or alcohol. You can talk to them, find out where their heart is, what's going on. Maybe you know that'll give you an opportunity to open the door for you to share the gospel, but. Be careful about jumping to conclusions, making assumptions. You know, be careful with that. Make sure that there's a need. And thirdly, ask yourself this. Am I giving and sharing with a heart of love? With a heart, true heart, sincere heart of love? Let a genuine love for the person in need be the sole reason you give. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 says, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful, cheerful giver. Now, I know and I understand that some of you may not have the financial or material needs to give and share. If that's you, 
don't worry, that's fine, that's okay. Again, the Lord knows your heart. He knows what's going on in your life. God knows what you can and can't give. And if He knows you can't give, He won't hold it against you. However, don't let poverty or lack of material resources keep you from helping those in need. There are other ways that you can give. You can give of your time. And you can give of your energy. Like I said, you can, you know, go to that homeless shelter, volunteer time there. You know, there are several nursing homes here. There's one in particular in the west side where, you know, I've been to, and a lot of the people living there, the elderly living there, don't, they're not having any visitors. They're there alone. They're just they're basically there to, to the end of life. One way you can show your love is by giving your time, your root, your energy. You, know, you can run errands for that elderly lady or man that lives in your community or in your block that can't make it to the store. It's just an example there, a couple of examples. I'm sure I can come up with many more. I'm sure you can think of other ways that you can give your time and energy, but that's how you can give. That's how you can show your love, your genuine love. If you want to experience and enjoy the love of God in your own hearts, you must love others, even to the point of sacrifice. You can exhibit love by acting on love more than speaking on it, or speaking of it. And that's the fourth um, example that we were given. You can exhibit love by acting on love more than speaking on it. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. I read this quote on social media a while ago and I kept it and because I thought it was thought it was a good one, thought it was a good quote and I thought it fit well here. Good deeds aren't done by walking into a church. They're done by walking out and helping others. Church. As I said from the beginning, I know that there are a lot of Christians here who have clearly demonstrated to me there to and to others genuine agape love if i'm describing you then i hope that this message here will will remind and encourage you to let brotherly love continue and my prayers are that you do not grow weary of doing good show the world through your example what the love of god looks like by how you treat and serve one another. If you desire to grow more as a believer, if you want to grow deeper in, in, the knowledge, in the knowledge of the Lord and you want to have a deeper relationship with Him, love more. Now, before I close, because we're going to be doing communion here in just a minute, I want to take a, a moment to speak to anyone watching or listening to this message online or maybe anyone going through a really difficult time and maybe having also a hard time grasping this concept of agape love. Maybe saying or thinking, I, I, yeah, I love people. I care for their well-being and I care for their, you know, for them, but... I don't understand. I don't get this agape love. Well, if this is you, I want you to know that you can. You can understand it. You can have it. But it's going to require you to give up something that you've held on to 
your entire life. It's going to require you to open the door to your heart to Jesus Christ and surrendering it to Him in order to know how to truly love others. You need to know the love of God. You need to experience the love of God. You need to have the love of God in you. And to know the love of God, you must be born again. If you want to be born again, the Bible says that you must do these these things. Admit you're a sinner. Repent of your sins. Believe that Jesus Christ died for you. Confess with your mouth that He is Lord. And freely accept His forgiveness. And if you've never done this, if you've never surrendered your life, and you want to now give yourself, give your heart to Him, surrender to Him, if you want to be born again, if you want to have that agape love, if you want to have that relationship with God that only believers have, then today's the day. Surrender your life. He loves you. He cares for you. And He wants a better life for you. He wants to give you eternal life. So if you're ready to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to lead you to the cross and uh, lead you in a prayer to do that. So wherever you're at, to close your eyes, bow your head, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. And I'll ask you to fill me to the brim with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you prayed that, welcome to the family of God. But we want to hear about it. We want to know that you prayed that. If you need to want information on maybe uh, you want to know where a good church you can go to in your area, we can, we can uh, find out for you. Uh, if you need a Bible, we can send one to you. Um, but we want to hear this story. We want to hear how you came to the Lord. If you think that someone needs to hear this, especially needs to hear this message, especially during this holiday season, especially during this Christmas season, and even next year, uh, you know, just share it if you can, if you're willing to, if you're willing, share this message, um, send it out. Um, but again, just simply sharing or sending this message, a life can change forever. So um, again, we want to hear from you. Please let us know how we can serve you. If you're here locally, we want to invite you to uh, our doors here. Or our doors are open to you here on the corner of Hondo Pass and Gateway South. Thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for being with us. Um, we look forward to, again, uh, sharing with you next week. Um, have a great week. Be blessed. We love you. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope we were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.